Okay, so th thanks for coming today. So, uh, uh, are we a couple of minutes early? A couple of minutes early, okay. So, let me just start off saying, so uh, uh, my colleague Botterdean and I will actually be co-presenting in this. So, you know, I'll cover the hardware space and Botterdean covers all of the, the software and firmware that's inside of, inside of Project Olympus. Um, as you all well know, hardware is just a vehicle for software. So, <laughs> so I guess we got a couple of minutes. Did everybody get out to the booths? Any feedback on the booths? You like them? You like the PDUs, yeah. All right. Good. Uh, are you up on the screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, it's time. Hey, full room. Thanks for thanks for everyone coming out. So, uh, 
We're going to talk about uh, Project Olympus. You know, basically this is the entire track today. So, you know, you can get the inter overview now. You can hear about servers next, and you know, and all the other pieces. You know, this is this is where you come to get more and more details. We also have a lot of information out on on GitHub for Project Olympus that will give you a point or two. Um, so. When we think about the, the system, you know, we think about our objectives. You know, what are we trying to do? So with this system, we decided we needed a brand new system. And, uh, and we needed to create that system in such a way that it's modular, it's building blocks. We enable the industry to build upon it. So we build the, the base building blocks and the industry um, comes and adds to it. And uh, this modular building block is much, much simpler, and that helps us, or it's, it's simpler in concept, and it helps us at scale. It helps us be able to deploy, you know, more flexible and configurable. But, you know, the big thing is the, the development model. So last, uh, last November at, at OCP, we un we unveiled Project Olympus. We were about halfway done with the project. And uh, we unveiled the, uh, the universal motherboard and the server, and we put that all out on GitHub. You know, we put, uh, we put uh, mechanical models out there. We put uh, specs out there. And so the intent was to encourage the community to contribute to this, you know, and to build upon it. And so what, what we really need to do is we need to close the gap of the year and a half development cycle for hardware. You know, we, we need to get closer to that three month gap that it takes like for software to turn around, um, to turn around good software. And so, you know, trying to open source, open sourcing the hardware, you know, we can start to get things done more quickly. Um, so, you know, the, the, and part of the big point of that is to get the industry, the ecosystem, the OCP community all engaged in this. So here's a picture of the rack that's out on the floor. Um, it's got all the, you know, this is of course is the GitHub where we have uh, the equipment. But you know, the, the, the heart of Project Olympus is the server. So, um, you know, this is a great partnership between uh, we win doing the development and Intel. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, David Locklear, um, platform architect at Intel. So, you know, it's, it's Intel's great partnership, you know, with David at, as the lead that really helped make this, really helped make this happen. So the, uh, the system, you know, is, is designed for you know, ease of use through OCP, you know, standards. So management, you know, we have uh, Redfish management um, off of Ethernet. It, um, we've, uh, you know, of course we're, we're using, so, so, you know, the, of course this, this board is using the next generation Intel Xeon processors, codenamed Skylake, you know, and uh, if you want to know when that'll come out, you know, ask David, yeah. <laughs> But it's got DDR, DDR4 memory in it, you know, high performance, high speed, high capacity. Um, a key feature to Project Olympus was we went to generic I.O. slots. So we have three PCIe by 16 slots out the front. We cable out the front. Um, what we found is that the, the, the rate of innovation in networking um, is much faster than the pace of everything else. And so, you know, we went from one gig to 10 gig to 40 gig to 50 gig, and very soon we'll be at 100 gig before you know it. And we need to be able to just swap cards in and out and be very, um, very easy to configure that. So we just need to be able to buy cards, put them in the server, and go. And so we went to standard, standard I.O. slots. Um, we have a, um, the, what we call the cloud SSD. They're M.2s, NVMe, so you know, they're readily available out on the market today. Um, they're very high performance, and uh, they're, they're kind of short and long and skinny. And that enables us to get just the right granularity, just the right capacity that we need. So if, if we had to buy big, 
big fat modules of flash, we would end up over provisioning our servers and paying a lot more money for the servers that we need. But with M.2s, we can choose you know, a much tighter granularity of exactly what type of flash we need. And it's high performance. It's uh, straight off the PCIe bus and uh, you know, gives us uh, best IOPS and, uh, and bandwidth. So one of, one of the things that we got, you know, we were here last year and we asked the OCP community, you know, what, what is it that you as a consumer, you, you as a customer of OCP hardware, what is it that you do that you do not see in today's or the previous generations of OCP equipment? And really, uh, it came down to management. We had one camp which says, I love my crash cart. I like to have technicians come up to the machine, plug into the machine, and repair it. Well, you know, the, the Microsoft servers and, and the previous generations of o OCP servers, they didn't do that because they're all set up for cloud scale. Everything is some software service off taking care of all of that for you. And uh, so, so we said, okay, let's enable crash cart access. Um, you know, we may not use it, but the manufacturers will, will be able to load it. You know, they've, they've tested it. They'll be able to load it, and you'll be able to have that without changing the hardware design. Another group of customers said, well, I don't really care about crash cart access, but the management, I don't want a separate wire, separate ethernet for my management. What I want is the management to go through the main NIC. That's what's called NCSI. Um, sometimes we call it sideband, but basically that, that sideband goes into the NIC and it goes up to the TOR, and then at the TOR they create a VLAN for management and then a VLAN for regular traffic. And so we've enabled that on the board as well as a, as a loading option. And along with it, you know, there's not really a standard way to get to it, but OCP has a mezzanine form factor that goes into other open rack equipment that we can plug, we can use that, you know, those mezzanines on a carrier card, and then we can cable the NCSI up to that. And so then you can get NCSI. But that's the type of feedback that we're looking for from Project Olympus, you know, changes that we should make to make the, uh, to make this, the servers more usable by everybody. Um, I wanted to talk about the power supply because when you look at the server, you know, the server looks a lot like an enterprise server. You know, it's one U, big sheet metal box with its own power supplies and fans. But when you look at an enterprise server, there's, two power there's, there's typically two power supplies sticking out the back. You can hot plug, hot replace them, but it's just two. You do it for, you know, data center, data center feeds come in, you have feed A, you have feed B. So you put them both into the server. If one of the feeds go down, the other power supply just um, keeps on running. And so, but at cloud scale, you know, requiring people to go back and cable, you know, add cabling and such in the hot aisle is, is actually an issue. So we decided we were going to go with a, uh, with a blind mate strategy, but still distribute that AC into the server, but we needed a new power supply for that. So we created a power supply that is actually three phase balance. So our data centers um, run with three phases, typically run with three phases coming in. And you want the load on each phase to be nearly identical. Because um, in our data center, if you have one phase that's lower than the others, then you have to drop the load on the other phases. And so it, you know, if you're in balance, you have to reduce the total capacity in the data center. And so we have three individual power supplies within this one silver metal box. And, uh, and that allows us to get three phase balancing. And, uh, but, but then, you know, like in the traditional data center, you have A feed, B feed, right? So to deal with that, we actually bring in two sets of three phases. We bring six phases into the power supply. The power supply auto detects which, which phase is up and running or you know, which feed is up and running, and it selects that and it runs off that automatically. So if you're, let's say you're running off feed A, and then uh, feed A goes down, boom, it'll switch over to feed B, or vice versa. And so uh, that, that 
enables us to get A feed, B feed. At the rack level, what's not stated here actually is at the rack level, what we do is, is we set it up so that like the bottom half of the rack defaults on feed A, top half of the rack defaults on B, feed B. And so then as long as we distribute our load across top and bottom half, then our feed A's and feed B's are, are auto balanced as well. So within this, you know, in the, in the enterprise servers, you can hot swap your power supplies when there's a failure. But for us, we say, you know, we don't want to really repair things unless, you know, as long as the failure rate is low enough, and we do believe the failure rate is low enough, we don't want to have to replace, you know, repair anything. So we have a N plus one built into the, built into the power supply. So if one of those individual power supplies fails, there's enough load available on the other two power supplies to let it keep running. And we believe that having to actually service a server to replace a power supply is going to be a very rare event. You know, we'll just let phases fail and, and uh, the probability of two phases failing is gonna be uh, very, very remote. At cloud scale, it will happen, but, um, but it's very small. So, you know, just wanted to make a mention that, uh, you know, there are other server vendors out there that have come forward onto Project Olympus. So, you know, we're very pleased that AMD, um, Cavium, and Qualcomm have, uh, are also building servers into the Mount Olympus specifications. And so that, that's, that just shows how the ecosystem can build up and become, uh, you know, be more robust. Once, once you don't have to worry about the power, once you don't have to worry about the cooling, how the management, you know, it's, you know, you, you can start adding more value. So again, back to power, a significant issue that we deal with is different data centers have different power cords. And so, you know, what we do in today's generations of servers is we have um, PDUs with a cable coming out with a specific power cord. And we build up a rack and it uses that PDU, it uses those power cables, and we decide it's, you know, it's going to this data center. Then we say, oh, no, never mind, we're going to send it to a different data center. And that different data center has a different power cord. So then we have to go to every one of the racks and rip out the PDUs, replace them and rewire it, and hopefully we got all the power cabling right and everything. And that, that's just a lot of labor to do that. And so what we did was we created a worldwide power, power cord solution such that you know with, with one single uh, connector, we can just change the power cord, just like you would with your, you know, the, the adapter cord on your, on your laptop. You know, you can have the European cord, you can have the US cord, whatever cord you want. And so the servers can ship anywhere without modification. You just ship the power cords to the data center, whatever power cord you need. So the rack, we love our 19 inch racks. Um, that's always been a, a big question, you know, what type of rack should we use? But the, uh, the 19 inch racks are uh, very standard, 600 millimeters wide, 1200 millimeters deep. Um, you know, it's been a standard for, uh, you know, decades and decades. And so, but, but there are features that we need in racks. We can't just use any rack, right? We've got a 3000 pound capacity on these racks. When you're filling these racks up with storage, with hard drives, you need a very high weight load capacity. And so, you know, that, you know, we, we can't just use any rack, but these racks are designed, you know, we have two different heights, 42U, just in case, uh, just in case your data center can't accept tall racks, or 48U. Um, 48U for us is a little more efficient. Uh, we can fit more, more capacity into the racks, and so that's what you want, is more IT gear. Um, but this rack is designed, you know, it's, we took an off-the-shelf rack and we made some modifications to it so that it would work well for Olympus. What we did was we actually added a third rail in the back so that we could have slides that go the full length of the rack. Um, 
and uh, you know, and the servers are pushed back a little bit so that you have room for uh, for cable routing up front. But otherwise, it 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 looks you know it looks like a standard 19-inch rack. If you have equipment, if you have tours, if you have off-the-shelf equipment that uses a standard 19-inch rack, this you know it'll it'll work in here as well. Because Microsoft wants you know just like we want one PDU, we want one rack, regardless of what equipment we put into it. So uh, Botterdine's going to come up and talk about rack management. Here. And it's hey, good morning. Uh, so uh, if you are not familiar with the previous generation, we have a chassis manager. Uh, so essentially what we do, we aggregate all the management into a single um, controller. Um, so before we have a 12 view, this is in generation, uh, the previous generation. We, in this generation, we moved to a rack level rack management. So we have only one controller um, that, uh, that manage uh, the whole rack. Okay, which? Oh, all right, okay, good, thanks. <laughs> all right, here we go. So, um, the rack management, so it's a, it's a small controller. It goes into the back of the rack into the PDU. Uh, it's, uh, it provides a REST API. Uh, actually, it's a Redfish-based API. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's integrated in the PDU. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it has two gigabit ethernet, and I'll, I'll dive deeper in the next couple of slides. It's a gigabit for each BMC. Uh, and this is, again, is uh, departure from the previous implementation. Uh, uh, it's, uh, the blades are NCSI enabled, like Mark mentioned. Uh, and we provide a, uh, also the rack manager provide KVM access to the, to the, to the blades. Um, it's, uh, so we don't, although we provide NCS, NCSI capability, that's for people who really wants to have the common, common port to the top of rack. Uh, Microsoft uh, uses a, a, a standalone separate uh, NIC for a separate switch for management. So we use a, a standalone switch. So, so that's an overview of the rack management. So um, why we, this is kind of guiding principles. So we really want it to be very simple. We want it to be scalable, cost effective secure and open. And I'll, I'll hit on all these points as we, as we, uh, oops. What happened here? Probably. Here we go. Yep. <laughs> yes. Okay. So here's the topology inside the rack. So. Um, we have a rack manager on the top. It goes to a uh, separate uh, management switch. The management switch is a really, um, it's, a, it's a commodity one gigabit switch. Uh, in this case, uh, I, we use Marvell switch. Uh, it's, you can see it in the, in the, uh, uh, in the booth. Um, it's a L2 plus switch. Uh, what I mean by L2 plus is uh, essentially, it has a little bit of L3 uh, features. And in particular, we, we create VPNs on each port. Uh, and that's essentially to provide, to provide us with certain flexibility inside the switch. Um, so uh, what does the rack manager do? We have power, essentially on off uh, to, the, to the blades. Um, and it provides serial sessions and out of band management, essentially. Um, it's, a, it's a one U. And it's integrated, it's integrated with the PMDU. Uh, in terms of communication, we use one gigabit AE. Uh, we provide serial console as well. Uh, the rack management also provides a server presence. And this is a departure from previous one where we don't know whether a server is, 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 is inserted or not. Uh, so in this generation, we actually provide server presence where we know whether a server is in or not. And this is very important because sometimes when a server is down, you don't know whether it's, 
it's an empty slot or a server is down, right? So the server presence gives, gives us that, that capability. Um, as I mentioned on, server on off, just basic power. We do power management, uh, as in uh, power capping on, the, on, the, on this generation. Uh, and that's what we call server throttle. So we can actually um, reduce the power of the server uh, based on certain external or internal events. Uh, and I'll cover this a little bit more detail later. Uh, the Rack Manager provides power metering. So it's uh, essentially, uh, it has a 12 ADC. So we, we measure uh, voltage and current, um, and we compute the power. Uh, it provides remote debug. So we have remote JTAG to the server, and we can actually, um, we can debug any device that has JTAG within the server. Uh, uh, remote media, we have remote USB, and this is actually handy, so we can actually do Pixie. Uh, sometimes when you don't, have, you don't have a Pixie server, you can actually, from the Rack Manager, you can Pixie to the, to the server, install any OS you want. Uh, and we provide also out-of-band firmware updates for UFI, for uh, BMC, power supply, any, anything that's programmable, we actually update the firmware. Okay, so here is a detailed uh, schematic. Um, so we're not going to dwell too much on it, but it, it essentially summarizes all the functionality that is that is in the Rack Manager there. Um, so we have temperature sensor. Actually, uh, there is a, even humidity sensor on the Rack Manager there. Uh, so you can get humidity on the data center. You can get at least uh, some humidity, finer granularity of humidity within the data center. Okay, so how this is different from the chassis manager of the previous generation? Uh, ARM versus x86. So um, we, there was a lot of feedback for, to us from the uh, OCP community. Uh, they wanted to go with, with ARM, um, and the reason is partially cost, partially flexibility, okay? There are lots of ARM uh, solutions out there uh, the shelf life tends to be longer. Uh, familiarity of the community with ARM is also, also much better. The OS, also that's the second point. Once you go to ARM, uh, you can get more Linux and, uh, distributions. So we went to ARM. We also switched to Linux from Windows. Uh, we went from serial to, uh, and when I mean serial, serial from the rack manager to the blade, right? So we used to be serial. We went to gigabit E. Um, Ethernet, one gigabit Ethernet, um, and that's where the scalability comes into place. So before, we used to have one switch, essentially one RST32 going from the rack manager to, to the blades, and as a result, we have only one, uh, 128 kilobit, essentially, bandwidth available, aggregate, right? Once we move to uh, gigabit E, uh, essentially, it opens up uh, all possibilities there, so we have higher bandwidth. Uh, we used to rack, versus 12U before the chassis had only managed 12U. Now we can manage the whole rack. And of course, we move to Redfish from a custom, custom REST API. What are the new features? Um, so we are providing power capping, uh, as I uh, alluded earlier. We have multi levels of power capping. We can do it at a node level. We can do it at a rack. We can do it at a row and we can do it at a uh, data center level. And actually, there is a presentation by, uh, later on by, Mar uh, by Malik Bulu, so he will actually go deeper into how we do power capping. Uh, but this is a very um, essential feature in the data center. It allows us to make better utilization of the power, which is the main, the main limiter in the data center, capacity limiter. Uh, we added the remote JTAG, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then we added also presence. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, presence turns to be a really uh, important feature. Uh, as I said again, sometimes we don't fill all the slots in the chassis or in the rack, and you don't know whether that slot is actually empty or is a server down. This is it's a, it's a minor feature, but it's really important. Uh, we added out-of-band firmware update, and anything programmable, PSU, uh, UFI, BMC, anything that's programmable can be updated. 
The Rack Manager is also is a OData client has in it, and this is also a very interesting feature, uh, Redfish feature. So what it means essentially, you don't have if you have a if you have a server or you have JBOD or you have any any component that goes into the Rack, if it's OData provider, uh, so it's, it's a, if it's Redfish, but Redfish has two flavors. OData is optional. So if if you implement the OData capability in your in your um, in your sled or blade or whatever component, the Rack Manager will actually would do auto discovery and expose the APIs automatically. So it's it's a flex. We don't have to specifically program for it. Okay, so here's the overall architecture uh, of the uh, Rack Manager. Um, so we provide essentially you can access through either Ethernet or, or serial to the to the rack manager serial is mainly for debugging and for uh, bare metal provisioning uh, the main access is Ethernet uh, we provide two types of API's you can go through rest or you can through command line so the command line we kept the old command line so for backward compatibility in the rest we provide two flavors we provide the old rest and we provide the redfish then so there's authentication at the REST and the, and the CLI level. Then we go to next layer, there is audit and log and then privilege. So the privilege we have, once you get authenticated, you can be either a user, you can be an operator, or you can be an administrator. So you get, you get assigned your privilege. The next layer is all the essentially bare level uh, communication from A squared C to IO to, uh, to the bare, very low level stuff. Um, and then you go into the action, actual action items, and that's where either either we are doing I/O, I mean power on, power off, uh, uh, on throttling, power throttling, and so on. We have a, in addition to the rack manager that is get inserted in the PDU on the back, there's actually a standalone rack manager. And the reason we did this, to reason we wanna want it to be available for the community as well who don't want to use the PDU, but also for our own use as well. Sometimes we have certain custom hardware that doesn't go into the PDU. We, we use this to manage, to manage the, um, that particular hardware. Okay, so one, one last word here. So the, uh, the we opened up all the schematics and all, and Mark can uh, elaborate on that later, but also we, uh, we put all the software for the Rack Manager on the GitHub, and you will see the link at the end, so we'll, we'll put the link on the, on the GitHub. So all the code that runs inside the Rack Manager is actually accessible as of last night. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Vaterdeen. So, so now let's talk about some of the other add-on modules that we're doing. Um, the first, of course, was the, uh, the hyperscale GPU accelerator, um, HGX1, that you see down in the, uh, in the video booth. You know, the thing that's, that's, really, that's really innovative about, the, especially innovative about this, is not only can you get the highest performing GPUs of your choice in it, but you can stack these together, cable them up in, uh, you know, in an appropriate fashion so that you can get up to 32 GPUs all working together on the same problem. And so we believe that that'll enable the customers who have the largest data sets that need to attack the largest problems, they'll be able to, uh, they'll be able to do that. Um, it is this, uh, the system that we have is designed to marry directly to an Olympus server. You can cable up a PCI Express um, 4x16s straight into the chassis. That leaves another 4x16s to be used to cable to the other chassis. Um, so that, you know, that basically what you create is a PCI Express peer-to-peer networking um, without ever going back through the CPU. So 
you know, the, the, the bandwidth between the chassis with the PCI Express is much greater than the bandwidth if you had to bottleneck everything going back through processors. So uh, we worked with uh, NVIDIA and Ingrasis on this. Um, you know, so it, it's a very exciting add-on technology that we've, that w that's been for, for Project Olympus. So the hard drive storage, this is very cool. We have a, in, 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 we have a 88 drive hard drive chassis. Um, it's in 4U, it, again, it's an add-on module. The Project Olympus server, uh, you can put one, two, or four of those uh, servers and talk to the JBOD. You can partition it up. You can have one server with 88 drives, two with 44, or four with 22. But we've put a tremendous amount of engineering into the requirements or, you know, into the requirements and into the implementation. So, you know, our focus was, you know, okay, we're doing this at cloud scale. We need the configurability of, you know, one, two, or four partitions in the chassis. We need the ability to ensure that we get the best reliability. So we need to keep the hard drive temperatures low. Plus, we also need to keep the vibrations and the impact of vibrations on the hard drives um, to, to a, a, an absolute minimum. And those two things are kind of contradictory because if you want low hard drive temperatures, what do you do? Turn up the fans, right? You turn up the fans, you shake the hard drives. And so then you lose performance. So it's like, you know, do you get reliability or do you get performance? We want both. And so, uh, you know, we were working with Quana on it and uh, um, Quana was, you know, loves to give me feedback that, Mark, your requirements are adding time to the schedule. So, but they're important. They're very important. Um, so, uh, it has its own power supplies in it. Basically, this is a high availability chassis. You know, we don't ever want this thing to go down. So, we have hot swap power supplies in this, unlike the server, um, because this can be partitioned across multiple servers. You don't want any outage you know, any outage will take down all servers, and you really don't want that. And so we have hot swap on the power supplies, we have hot swap on the fans. Um, so it looks, looks and feels much like, uh, you know, many of the high availability uh, enterprise chassis, but with a cloud scale interface, cloud scale needs of high performance, low cost. We're also working on the, uh, you know, I missed an update. So uh, anyways, we're, we're working on a, a flash, um, flash storage system. So this storage system is intended to, you know, we, the, to utilize the same M.2 cloud SSDs that I talked about earlier with the NVMe drives. So we wanna be able to put 64 of these into a, into a, a single, single box. But you know, 64 is a tremendous amount of capacity you know, today, if you buy a terabyte drive, you know, that's, that's, that's 64 terabytes. You know, we don't think it'll be long before there's two terabyte, four terabyte M.2s out there. You know, you're talking 256 terabytes. So that's a huge amount of flash. And so what you really don't want is you don't want to make it all or nothing. And so what we've done is we're creating this, this carrier card this carrier holds four M.2s, and so it allows two, two different scenarios for us. You know, one scenario is that, of course, if, a, if an M.2 fails, you can go up, pull the carrier out, replace the M.2, plug it back in. But probably more importantly is that you want to buy this thing, but you don't want to load 64 M.2s because that's really expensive all at once. So maybe you want to load a fourth of them, just 16 M.2s to start with. And you say, well, maybe later I'll... I'll I'll add sticks or I'll add carriers as I need capacity. And so that's what this chassis is really designed to do is, you know, it's more of a pay as you grow sort of model. Um, so again, this will, uh, this chassis will be married directly to the, to the servers and uh, tied in with that. And so it'll provide all the same Olympus features. We have a BMC inside of it. So we're utilizing for Actually, for, the, for, for our add-on chassis, we're utilizing OpenBMC. 
you know, they're the, uh, we, th we really like that, that initiative through OCP, and so uh, we're, we're all in on that for, for these add-on modules. So, um, so at the GitHub, we've got uh, specifications, some mechanical collateral out here on the right. Um, we have a temporary place right now for the, uh, for the Rack Manager, but this is all the Rack Manager software. It's, it's, it's all out there now. Um, so, you know, free for you to go and, and download anytime. So, again, uh, today the, the, there's going to be several tracks on Olympus. Um, I think the next one is more deep dives on motherboards. And we have the, uh, the high density flash, the JBOD, and the HGX1 accelerator as well. So, thank you. We have a little bit of time for some questions. On that big uh, JBOD, are, uh, are the drives also hot swappable? Yes. Oh, yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The drives are hot swappable as well. Yeah, um, can you explain more uh, what you mean by um, Rack Manager instance in the cloud? It was uh, earlier on the slides. The what do you mean by a Rack, a Rack Manager instance in the cloud? The rack manager, the standalone rack manager. What, um, can you explain what is a rack manager instance in the cloud? Uh, in oh. the instance? Instance. instance in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So all the, uh, the rack manager uh, connects to all the blades to all the servers within the rack. So when the fabric, when outside of the rack, the Azure fabric or we call it fabric, uh, the, the cloud manager, when the cloud manager wants to talk to the blade, it doesn't talk to the blade directly. It goes through the rack manager. So, so the rack manager provides an entry manageability entry point to the whole rack. So it's abstracts, it abstracts the whole rack essentially for, for the fabric control. Yeah. No. Question. What? Question? Oh. Any other question? Yeah, just on the power supplies, do they have any sort of a battery backup in them? Or I know some of the other solutions here do. Battery, short run well, timer. So, so there will be some battery capacity in there, but it won't be for full UPS. So last year we came out and we talked about less, our less local energy storage that can do full like replacement of data center UPSs. These, there will be some battery in there we, for, uh, for good experimental purposes, you know, the research guys write lots of papers on peak shaving, valley filling, you know, stuff like that. So, so we're, we're working on it. Um, so, you know, right now there's an option with and without. Okay. The, the, the box is big enough to fit them in if we decide to use them. How much runtime are you targeting then for a... Or is there not a spec for that yet? Or I'm just curious. But yeah, it's not. It's not spec'd out. Yeah, we have the. We reserve the space for them. Gotcha. So. All right. Okay. Which session will you be talking about the power capping in? Oh yeah. Oh. So there are actually uh, Ali Larijani. What, what is Ali here? Is that? Hmm? At two o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, it's not okay. but two o'clock, yeah, yeah. It's not complete list. Yeah. Uh, the three, three other sessions um, in the afternoon are around software. There is one on node manager, rack manager, and power capping. Yeah. When it's talking about a JBOT, it's a hot service, and how about an MVM in the all flash J, JBOT? It's a hot service? Yeah, yeah the, the, the NVMe flash JBOD is also intended for four M.2s on a single carrier. A single carrier can be hot removed and added. Um, you know, as you know, the, the, 
that requires a lot of work through the through the OS stack, and uh, so you know the, whether we enable every feature day one remains to be seen. Um, you know, we th we think that the biggest benefit is starting like you know partially populated and and adding as you need capacity. That's that's the number one feature that we have to add, and the actual yeah just go up you know and pull a pull a carrier out yeah. I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll see if we get that one. Oh no no no. The, the the carrier has a connector at the back. You pull it out and it's out. It's off. So so that's why it gets to be difficult. If you wanna if you wanna take a carrier, pull it out. You know you have to through software. You have to drain the use of that. You know because if you're sending tra you know traffic down to it and you pull it out, that's a problem. Um, so you have to you have to drain it via the via the operating system. You have to drain the use of it. You have to disable it. You know, there's a lot of things you have to do. It's not not even as simple as a doorbell, right? A doorbell can't do it. You got to have it up and down through the entire software stack. So that's really hard to do. Yeah. So it's a managed managed hot plug. Yeah. 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 A question. Uh, I had a bunch of questions, but I don't know where <laughs> they're covered. <laughs> Uh, I'll ask the easy one first. So can you share a little more information on the connectivity between the compute, JBOF, JBODs, how they're connected in the back? Uh, yeah, it's to, to, the, to the PDU, the connector? Uh, no, to each other, actually. To, to each, each, other, each other? Yeah, so it's the 48 or uh, the JBOD is a pretty large one, right? In, in the back, it needs to be connected to the server. Oh, so, so uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, Uh, this picture doesn't show it, but we have it out on the booth. So what, what we've actually done is there is a cable management arm, but it's inside of the chassis. So for the JBOD, there's, there's a shell on the very outside, and inside of the shell are some cable management arms. And we take the cables directly from um, inside of the chassis that goes out, you know, fans out to the expanders, through a cable management arm, and we come out and we bring it all the way out of the server. We don't even create a plug-in point at, or out, out of the JBOD. We don't create a plug-in point at the JBOD. We take the cables all the way out, straight up to the servers. So we get much better signal integrity that way. And so what you'll see, you should take a look down on the floor. We have four servers there. Each server has a single, single SAS connected. There's four SAS cables coming out. One, you know, and the show floor is one per server. So uh, yeah, it's PCIe. So the JBOF will work, and we'll, we'll have a deep dive on it too. But the JBOF will work where you'll you'll have a what would normally be like a PCIe card, right? But on the PCIe card will be a uh, PCIe cable connector, and then we just cable directly up to it. And so that that one won't have any cable management arms. It'll just be just a short cable between them. Yeah, from the server, from the server directly. So is the same cable, same concept, a cable connect to a GPU box or the? Yeah, the, the GPU box is uh, is very is is essentially the same concept. It's implemented a little bit differently. So in the in the GPU box, um, there's there's a little opening at the front. You can't, I guess you can't see it, but below here there's kind of an opening. And what we've made is so that the risers out of the Olympus server, like PCI Express risers, you put cable headers on those, and then you just jumper the cables up directly to the chassis. And so again, it's, it's PCIe cabled up to the chassis, but it's, it's not external cables, essentially. It's, it's essentially internal cables. It's as if we, for, for expansion, we didn't want it to be coupled with the server, so we made it for you, so we could stack four chassis together. But you know, you could think of it as is the one use server is is actually mated to the four use server via these internal cables. So you, you can, we could show you down on on the floor too. Oh yeah, one o'clock. There's a session.
questions. So uh, the bigger question was, uh, have you taken like, a, obviously you must have run workloads, right? For a specific workload, do you have the ratio of compute, JBOF and JBOD and how they're distributed across that? So for, um, for Microsoft's applications, it's, it's, things are a little bit different. Um, we'll have like a storage rack. You know, so we have we have a storage service, we have a compute service, and so like for storage, we'll have a rack with a, a bunch of JBODs and a bunch of ser compute servers attached to them, and via the via the networking, it talks to the virtual machines and such. So you can go to Azure and you can buy storage capacity, and it just goes into these racks. So the compute doesn't happen on the. So we have had no notion of head nodes, but those are just provides essentially storage over, over network. They are, not, they are not applications per se, right? Have like failover, like failover no, we don't, yeah. do, we don't do failover in hardware, so it's all yeah. done in software. So you have always replicas, yeah. right? So you do it. Yeah, there's, there's some nice research papers out there, but what our storage team does, they do a stamp of 10 or 20 racks, and they actually do CR, you know, they, they, they have a combination of, you know, replicas they'll, they'll do, coding, yeah, yeah if, it's, if it's hot data, I think they do straight replication of files. If it's cooler data, they do erasure encoding across racks. So an entire rack can go dark, actually two or three racks, I think, can go dark, and you still, get, still keep your data. I was curious uh, if an uh, end user wants to have a different fan algorithm, like maybe they have a different acceptable performance to reliability on their hard drives, you know, that RVI thing, or uh, if they want to put in a, a much hotter GPU, for example, how would that sort of uh, mechanism work? You know, would they be able to make those sort of trade-offs and, and tune the thermal algorithms based on the open... So yeah. Code or, or yeah. So, so, so the way I would say it is: What if you have a different hard drive, a different GPU, a different, a different whatever, and it has different requirements and that sort of thing? You, you need to tune the fans differently. So then, like for for the HGX one, you know, you'd work with Ingrasis to tune it to. Well, the, I mean, it does have Open BMC on there, right? So in theory, you could just go off and download the source code and at your own peril. You know, because if, if you mess up the fans and run them too low, your extremely expensive GPUs will burn up, right? And you don't want that, right? So, um, but you as an, as an OEM provider, you know, I'm sure that you can make sure that that gets done. But yeah, it's, it's, it's open source, that open BMC code with the fan algorithms and that sort of thing. But it's, it's intended to be more standardized, you know, so it'll... Like for the hard drives, it'll go down and ask the hard drives, what are your temperatures? And, you know, it'll set the fans according to that. And so, yeah, you can change the fan algorithms and, and things. Yeah. Um, so just don't a, change them when we're yeah. shipping so, it I mean, to so us. You, yeah, so either way, so you have, you have the code, you can customize, but also, uh, like Mark said, I mean, most of the algorithms are driven by interrogating the device, what's your temperature, and then they set, they set the temperature according. You know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone.